just get recording and sharing. Perfect. That's the right thing, right? Perfect. <laughs> right. Well, hello, and thank you so much to everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, as Lauren said, many of you will already know me as I usually host here every month as the Castle's Education Officer. And what you will just have learned is that I'm also a PhD student at the University of Glasgow. So this week I'm here in a slightly different capacity. So as a student, my work straddles the departments of medieval history and archeology span and my thesis, which is thankfully very near complete at this point, focuses on motivations behind fortification in 14th century Northumberland, which has given me the opportunity to study in depth the physical repercussions of the Scottish Wars of Independence. And now I'm not sure how much this crowd will know about Northumberland, though most of you are likely to know that it's England's northeasternmost county and makes up much of England's border with Scotland. Throughout much of the 14th century, the map of known fortifications in Northumberland went from this in 1296 to this in 1415. And I'll come back a little bit later to why 1415 is important. Now, don't worry, I promise I haven't lured you into a talk just about Northumberland, but I do think it's important to start here, as the vast majority of fortifications which were built in Northumberland in this period fall under the category of Tower House, and it's largely how the Tower House is introduced in Britain and the late medieval period. Between 1296 and 1415, around 98 new fortifications were built in Northumberland. Of those for which either physical or historical evidence can attest to their layout, at least 73 were tower houses, and those are the ones that are just the little pink dots. The reason for the high number of these towers in the borders compared to the rest of the country has received some attention in recent years by Dr. Andy King at Southampton and the now retired Professor Philip Dixon. Providing the insight that square or rectangular towers were cheaper and easier to build than bigger complex castles, which seems pretty obvious. And they also provided defensible but also slightly prestigious dwellings for the gentry looking to fortify by the 15th, looking to fortify. Oh, sorry, we've got people entering. By the 15th century, tower houses had spread to the Anglo Norman Irish border where they would remain prevalent for another two centuries and tower houses of a kind had reached Scotland by the late 14th century, though they weren't built en masse in Scotland until at least the 1400s. So tonight I'll briefly discuss when the tower house became prevalent across England and Ireland, and then we'll move on to discuss trends of the tower house building across Scotland, namely where they were built, why they change in style from grand tower, the, grand castles of the 13th century and how they evolved between the period of the Wars of Independence to the Union of the Crowns. This brings us to asking, what is a tower house? And this is a bit of a difficult question and one that has a different answer depending on who you ask. For this talk though, a building needs to fit all of these criteria to qualify as a tower house. First, generally it needs to be 17th century or before. I suppose you could build a tower house today, but I for one am unlikely to call it one. Two, it needs to have more than one level. It's not a tower house if it's only the ground floor. And three, it needs to be the only fortified or thickly stone walled building in the complex, although it can have a wall around it, like the Barmican wall that we have at Dundonald. So think of the difference between Alexander's castle at Dundonald, so that's this one in the little picture, and our current castle. What we think of as Alexander's castle has two large gate houses and additional towers built into the walls. So we'd call this a castle. Dundonald Castle, as it stood in the 14th century, is one large rectangular building, possibly with a small building in front of it, which we call the chapel, and a barmican wall around it. And that we can call the so that means that we can call the 14th century version of Dundonald Castle a tower house. The tower houses that were built in the late 13th century and early 14th century in Northumberland generally took a very different shape to our dear Dundonald's. 
The earliest datable towers in Northumberland include Charlton Peel and Corbridge Vickers Peel, both built around 1300. Of those, Corbridge, which you see in the pictures, is still intact and assuming it survived lockdown is a functioning pub, so I can highly recommend. They then stretched nearly evenly throughout the century with a notable gap from 1346 to 1348 and then through to 1415, which is where we end because, and I promised I'd come back to this, in 1415, a survey was conducted of the fortifications in Northumberland. This survey provides us with the names and owners of supposedly every fortification in Northumberland at the time, including 33 towers built in Northumberland prior to 1415, which are mentioned nowhere else in history before that date, meaning we can't pin down when they were built apart from it was before 1415 and most likely after 1300. The average tower house in Northumberland had a footprint of around 100 to 150 square meters, including the stone walls, which ranged from one to three meters thick, often thicker at the base, and were typically of three stories. It can be difficult to reconstruct what the stories were used for, and descriptions often vary, but modern depictions of later tower houses show livestock or storage, or in the larger houses, sometimes even guard rooms or kitchens on the ground floor, living space on the second floor or above, and bedrooms reaching up above that. Larger towers were built for wealthier families and differ greatly in their structure, and a few layout and a few lay out the rooms more for style than protection, with living space including fireplaces and windows on every level. Most of these, most of the men who owned the 81 Northumbrian towers that are lifted, listed on the 1415 survey were not of the upper elite and had only one tower and no other Northumbrian properties in their name, meaning that for many, these towers likely served as their primary residence and only means of protection within the county. 10 tower owners were religious entities, so five vicars, two rectors, one hospital, and Tynemouth Priory, who controlled Whitley Tower and Coquette Island Tower, and the Archbishop of York, who controlled both towers in Hexham. Pontyland Vickers Tower and Corbridge Vickers Tower are among some of the best intact ru tower ruins in the county. Both Corbridge and Pontyland represent stout, modest towers, which could have provided protection for the vicar and possibly the surrounding village if need be. Another survey of the fortification of the English marches was conducted in 1541, and this one gives us slightly more insight into their use. Judging by this survey, Peel Towers and Tower Complexes could hold a garrison of between 50 and 100, though it seems a bit cramped to have 100 people in there. Most of these towers were built near to the church or village and seemed to have defensive implications for their community, as can especially be seen by the notes in the 1541 survey, which comment on the aid which was provided by both the fortification and the garrisons of these spaces. Community engagement can especially be seen in the two towers at Hexham, owned by the Archbishop of York in 1415, one, jail, one a jail and one a hall for commerce and administration. Apart from those owned by the Archbishop of York and the size and layout, uh, it, uh, sorry. Apart from those owned by the Archbishop of York and the Prior of Tynemouth, Hexham's towers seem to have similar, seem to be similar in decoration. They differ in size and layout, though it is likely due to their original purpose being communal and not for private use. One was a jail and one for commerce, and Coquette Island Tower, which is now gone, was quite small and part of a monastic cell, so there is little to compare it to apart from perhaps the much larger Peel Castle off the South Cumbrian coast. Of the three towers listed in 1415, only three of the towers listed in 1415 belong to the highest members of the aristocracy. One was held by John of Lancaster, first Duke of Bedford, son of the King, one to Henry Percy, second Earl of Northumberland, and one to Gilbert Umfreville, head of a strong Northumbrian family. They all, however, have several larger properties in the area which served as their main residences, apart from the Duke of Bedford, who never permanently resided in the area. Instead, he just held temporarily the estates of the Percys. The remaining 20 builders were all men of relatively 
high local status. Each one served either in Parliament, a Sheriff of Northumberland, or both, along with various other local offices. Of these 20, only five had more than one tower, and nine had also had larger properties using towers as smaller ports of call or outposts for distant properties. The lack of tower ownership, particularly among the upper aristocracy, implies that the trend of tower building existed mainly in lower to middle levels of noble society and was distinct from the trends in des and designs of higher status residences and castles. The prominent ownership of only one per immediate family implies that lesser gentry generally built a single tower as their main residence and fortification and higher nobility used towers as subsidiary fortifications. The few surviving examples of this are Anna Merle's Peel, which seems to protect the area to the west of Anna Castle, so this is what's pictured here, and Otterburn Tower belonging to the Umphrevilles, which stands in an area to the northwest, northwest of the county, which has very little other fortification and may have provided subsidiary accommodation or protection in this region. This seems to indicate that towers originated out of military necessity and provided quick and affordable a quick and affordable alternative to large and ornate castles, which might have been built in more peaceful times. Outside of Northumberland, it comes as no surprise that Cumbria has the most towers in the, in the country by a wide margin. At least 18 known tower houses were built in or around the 14th century in Cumbria, most taking similar forms to those in their eastern neighbor. As in Northumberland, towers were generally built of local stone and ranged around 100 square meters. This makes perfect sense considering that Cumbria would have also lived with the constant threat of Scottish raiding throughout the 14th century. This trend in the north is reinforced by the fact that in the rest of England, only a handful of known tower houses were built in the 14th century. I could confirm only eight instances of towers built elsewhere, nine if we include Longthorpe Tower in Northamptonshire, which was built at the end of the 13th century. These eight cropped up in six different counties, Warwickshire, Lancashire, Lincolnshire, Shropshire, Devonshire, and Cheshire. And it's interesting here that most are situated in the border areas or those still exposed to potential raiding, the counties of Lancashire, Lancashire, Cheshire, and Shropshire spreading down from Cumbria and along the border to Wales. Overall, the information we have for towers outside the northern counties is sparse. What can be said for these towers is they all seem to follow some pattern of size and shape and all seem to be built by a rough, roughly similar types of people and likely for similar aims as those in the north. In the 15th and 16th centuries, Fortified building in the north of England evolved slightly to include larger tower houses and what would be called vassals by expanding the footprint of the house on the ground instead of moving upwards here. Upwards, here, some of the initial military integrity of the building was, a, was compromised, but this new design allowed for larger and grander rooms, which tower houses couldn't have afforded. Towers in Ireland began to gain popularity shortly after their peak in Northumberland. In the start of the 15th century, not surprisingly, they were most common in areas of Anglo-Norman settlement, seemingly due to the encouragement of the English crown, which is evident after 1429, when Henry VI of England passed a statute which made available 10 pounds, which was a decent sum at that time, to any man who built a tower house in the Pale, specifically within the measurements of 6.1 by 4.9 by 12.2 meters. Far more common in Ireland they, than they ever were in England, the county of Tipperary alone had 398 tower houses, and estimates for the total number of towers in Ireland range as high as 3,000 to 6,000, according to estimates by Tom McNeil, C.T. Cairns, and David Sweetman. The average size of the Irish tower seems relatively similar to the 15th and 16th century towers in England, i.e. slightly smaller than their 14th century predecessors, ranging from around 50 up to 120 meters squared. In Ireland, these towers often sat in a complex surrounded by a bawn or weakly fortified stone wall with a simple entryway. While the bond would not have protected against large scale raids, it would serve to ward off thieves and protect livestock, making it useful for everyday life in a dangerous region. Stone vaulted basements were common across the whole of Ireland as they were in England. 
Tower entrances seem to be situated on the ground floor with very small defenses prote protecting them, such as iron grates, and often murder holes over the entrance passage, as in Milltown and Kill and Cool, which you see in the slide here, where the width of the passage was typically only wide enough to allow for two people to enter at a time, controlling the flow of incoming forces. There have been a few attempts to trace the roots of the Tower House in Ireland, for example, in An Historical Geography of Ireland by B.J. Graham, he rejected the idea that Irish towers mimicked Scottish tower houses, given their lack of popularity in Ulster, the region most prominently associated with Scottish migration in the late medieval and early modern periods, though he failed to investigate their possible link to the English Tower House. Terry Berry attributes their or the origins of Irish tower houses to the square 12th century keep so popular among Anglo-Normans in Ireland, which, as I mentioned before, also seems to be the case in Northumberland. The population of Irish tower house builders also resembles those in England. Lower gentry with small towers trickling up to higher nobility with larger towers. The main difference in the builders of Irish towers in the 15th and 16th centuries is that while in Northumberland, towers were beginning to re be replaced by houses and slightly larger fortifications, towers had become the primary mode of fortification in Ireland. And again, according to Terry Berry, no large castles were built anew in Ireland from the start of the 14th century. While the tower house had begun its decline in England by the middle of the 16th century, conflict continued to rage in Ireland in this period and the tower houses maintained their foothold to the beginning of the Cromwellian conflict when the arrival of powerful guns proved superior to the tower's defenses. The most interesting piece of evidence by far left to us regarding Irish tower buildings is of course Henry VI statute from 1429. While the dimensions listed in the statute, as I mentioned, 6.1 by 4.9 by 12.2 meters make for a surprisingly small building it seems most surviving towers exceeded that size. It also seems clear that Henry's proposal was taken up on, as in 1449, Henry saw fit to impose a limit to the number of towers the statue applied to in County Meath, which to me means at least, which to me at least implies that the offer of 10 pounds in exchange for building your own fortification was so popular that he had to limit the supply, at least in Meath. While the motivation behind the statue is not explicitly stated, it is possible that the king saw the usefulness of the tower as a fortification for the gentry in the Scottish borders and hoped to replicate this kind of protection in Ireland, where he was clearly encouraging people to protect their own lands. While a statue of this kind has not survived in England, different encouragement can be seen. As fortification close to the border received crown support for garrisoning and victual, victuals or supplies for the keeping of fortifications and even smaller fortifications such as Blythe, Hagerston, Barmore and Langley often saw the honor of a royal visit on the Kingsway North. The information applied from Irish towers back onto tower houses in England supports the idea that the tower house grew out of necessity for varying levels of upper society to fortify in an area where small scale warfare was a way of life. This explains why the Tower House thrived only in the north of England and in Ireland where the king specifically called for personal fortification. All of which brings us very nicely and finally to Scotland, where the cause for the Scottish Wars of Independence and the tactics engaged by the Scottish armies become significantly more relevant. In 1286, Alexander III, King of Scotland, passed away suddenly, leaving no sons behind him. Instead, he was succeeded by his granddaughter, Margaret, nicknamed the Maid of Norway, who was not yet three years old. Given Margaret's age, Scotland went on to be ruled by a group of six guardians, while Margaret remained in Norway. Four years later, in September of 1290, Margaret sailed from Norway, but died en route to Scotland, age seven, kicking off a period in Scotland known as the Succession Crisis. Many claimants came forward to assert their right to the throne, and in 1291, the sitting guardians of Scotland asked Edward I, King of England, to assist in choosing their next king. In the end, Edward chose John Balliol for the job. Balliol, like his fellow claimant Robert Bruce, not the one we know, but his grandfather, traced his lineage back to William the Lion, his great-great-uncle. The reasons behind Edward's choice seem to have been that Balliol was perceived as a man who would bow easily to England and perhaps serve as kind of a puppet king, 
This, however, wasn't really to be. Balliol proved largely unpopular with both Edward I and within Scotland, and by 1295, a new group of guardians was formed in opposition to John Balliol, and together they sent terms to France to form an alliance against England. In February of 1296, this alliance was signed into action, causing Edward I to begin his war against Scotland the following month. And in, in July, Balliol officially surrendered to the English, officially ending his kingship. From the outset of the war, the superiority of the English forces in open warfare seemed clear, particularly in numbers. The English took immediate victories at the Siege of Berwick and the Battle of Dunbar in early 1296. And by the end of 1297, the English held key fortifications at Berwick, Dunbar, Edinburgh, Jedburgh, and Roxburgh, having failed only at their attempts to capture Stirling Castle against William Wallace's forces in September of 1297, though Stirling did eventually fall to the English in 1304. English control over these key fortifications gave the English a large amount of control over trade, particularly in Berwick, and possibly more crucially, the English placed garrisons in each site under their control, which allowed them to exert some level of military control over the surrounding area. So, the financial and military control loaded, lorded over the Scots by the English control of key Scottish fortifications was a hard lesson that the Scots learned early on. And it served as a basis for some key tactics employed by the Scots throughout the First War of Independence, particularly under the military leadership of Robert the Bruce, who began fighting for the Scottish cause, at least for the first time, in 1297. Bruce's forces saw the importance of keeping strategic fortifications out of the hands of the English, and knowing that they were not in a place to protect sites targeted by the English forces, instead, Bruce instructed his subjects to slight or destroy their own castles to keep them from being useful to the English. This was done at some point in the late 13th and early 14th century at Inverlochy, Inverness, Urquhart, Edinburgh, Stirling, and many more, including very possibly Dundonald. The military and financial state of Scotland throughout the Wars of Independence also essentially halted the building of new fortification particularly in the border region of Scotland, where the only building which was taking place in the early years of the war was overseen by Edward I and the English. Meaning that not only were there no new fortifications being constructed, but any existing sites were being torn down. The First War of Independence ended with the signing of the Treaty of Edinburgh Northampton in 1328, leaving the Scots with a firm advantage. The treaty, however, made enemies of cross-border magnates who had fought for the English in the conflict, depriving them of their lands in Scotland. And only four years after the treaty was signed, Edward Balliol, son of the once King John Balliol, sailed from his exile in France to exert his claim on the Scottish throne and found support among this group of magnates, now labeled the Disinherited, all kicking off the Second War of Scottish Independence. Edward III of England soon joined Edward Balliol's cause, and the Second War lasted, at least in practice, until David II's capture in 1346. When the Second War came to a formal end in 1357, both the physical and financial state of the Scottish nation were in tatters. North of the Anglo-Scottish border, the Wars of Independence had seen frequent raiding and destruction of large swathes of land and many fortifications throughout Scotland in the first half of the 14th century. And the treaty, which had brought the war to its formal end, had imposed upon Scotland a crippling ransom of 100,000 marks to be paid in installments for the return of their King David II, who had been captured at the Battle of Neville's Cross and held in English captivity from 1346 to 1357. Before the end of the wars in Scotland, tower houses seemed to be quite rare. The first possible date for a tower house is Drum Castle in Aberdeenshire, circa 1286. And the layout seems to be quite similar to some towers, high status tower houses like Eglinton, which were built in the north of England some years later. Rectangular with walls three and a half meters thick and the original entrance on the first floor level. Though whether the tower at Drum actually dates from the 13th century or much later has come under some debate in recent decades. 
There are a few other locations where tower houses were possible in the 13th century, for instance, Dunedir, Cairnbog, Garthland, Yester Castle, Travac Castle, Grangemount. However, all of these sites, either at all of these sites, either the dating or the structure of the building hasn't yet been verified. The start of the 14th century saw only one significant instance of a possible tower building, and that was and that occurred at Dunn's Castle which is said to have been built around 1320 by Thomas Randolph, first Earl of Murray. First Earl of Murray. <laughs> and while the timing here seems a bit strange, compared to building in the rest of Scotland, so far as the war was concerned, in 1320, Scotland was in a relatively good place. After Edward I's death of England, <laughs> Edward I of England's death in 1307, England had been under the rule of his son, Edward II, who was not only an inferior military leader, but also pro proved decisive, divisive <laughs> within England, causing internal conflict and taking attention away from the conflict on the border, allowing Scots to gain ground in Scotland and obtain their historic victory at Bannockburn in 13, 1314. In April of 1318, under the command of Sir James Douglas, the Scots recaptured the key border town of Berwick upon Tweed, and it remained in their possession until 1333. These circumstances may have made Randolph feel safe enough to undertake a building project in the borders. Its location so close to the border and its builder, the Earl of Murray, who would likely have been intimately familiar with this style of building from his writing in Northumberland, shortly before the alleged construction of Dunn's Castle might explain its appearance quite similar to its contemporary English counterparts, 15 by 10 and a half meters with a small projecting wing. Again here though, there is some debate and while the records refer to the land that Dunn sits on and Thomas's presence there around 1320, it has been argued that nothing of the tower structure itself dates to before the 15th century, meaning that before the end of the Second War of Independence, we don't have any firm dates for tower houses. The first large wave of fortification, of fortified building didn't come until a decade after the Second War of Independence's conclusion, Independence, Second War's conclusion, wow. And when widespread construction of, a large fort, of large fortifications did finally resume, it was not in the form of large castles, which were prominent in pre-war Scotland. Instead, this next wave of fortified buildings started around 1368 with the erection of David's Tower inside the complex at Edinburgh Castle. In the succeeding years, David's Tower was followed by Threve Castle, Dundonald Castle, Cuthalley Castle, Lennox Love, and Balthiac, all around the same size, between 15 and 17 meters long and 10 and 13 meters wide. Throughout the last 35 years of the 14th century, a possible 47 tower houses were built throughout Scotland in a vast range of styles and sizes, the smallest of which was Mankerton Tower in Dumfries and Galloway, which, me which measured 10 by 8 meters, still comfortably larger than Hethpool and Redchester Towers, which both came in around 58 square meters and were the smallest in England at the time. Of the towers that we can say with any certainty were built in Scotland in the 14th century, more than half of them were simple and oblong in shape. This includes, of course, Dundonald, but also Threve, Closeburn, Borv, Fivey, and Loch Leven. Of these, Dundonald comes in at the largest, with the main 14th century block measuring around 20 meters by 14 meters externally and four stories tall. The others, however, are not hugely smaller, with three that 18.6 by 12 meters and five stories tall, and then Borv at 18 by 9 meters, Closeburn at 10 by 15, Lucklevin at 11 by 9 and a half. So all coming in with a footprint comfortably over 100 square meters, and each belonging to extremely important owners, including the then King of Scotland, Robert II, Archibald Douglas, the third Earl of Douglas, or in the case of Lucklevin, the Douglas family in general, and the Kirkpatrick family for the Clo for Closeburn Castle. For the layout, the most information comes from Dundonald, Threve, and Loch Leven, which, despite their varying locations throughout the country, bear some striking resemblances. To begin with, all three were comprised of one large oblong tower with likely unfortified outbuildings including possible stables or kitchens, and each had a barbican wall similar to the one which still exists today at Dundonald. 
and evidence exists at Fivey Castle as well for a curtain wall. Perhaps most importantly, all three of these on the screen were thought to have vaulted basements and original entrances at first floor level, originally accessed by a wooden stair or ladder. The layout of the rooms at Loch Leven even strikingly resemble our own, with stores and their kitchen on the ground floor, serving area with a screen and a hall on the first floor and then another hall above. While at Thrive, the building remains similar, but the use is slightly different, with stores and the prison on the ground floor and a hall above. Sadly, very little information is available for the internal layouts of Close Burn. Sorry, we've got people waiting. Right. Sadly, very little information is available for the internal layouts of Close Burn, which is now a private residence, or 5E, and not enough remains of Borf to accurately understand the layout. Of the other 14th century buildings, here we go. Of the other 14th century buildings, both are small L plan towers, including David's Tower in Edinburgh, begun in 1368, and Needpeth Castle. Not enough remains to tell us what the upper layout might have been at David's Tower, though it seems that both Needpeth and David's Tower, each level was broken into a series of rooms or had rooms built into the thickness of the walls, as opposed to existing in one large room, as in the oblong tower houses. This allowed for more privacy, a style which gained traction in the following centuries. In the 15th century, two major shifts occurred in building. First, thanks in part to the gradually improving situation in Scotland, tower houses were increasing in number and in size. Not only were new towers being erected, but old towers were undergoing expansion in order to add more rooms and increase the levels or privacy in the once large and open spaces, as we just mentioned. And second, the new popularity of tower houses spread to slightly lower levels of society, causing smaller towers to be erected to serve gentry as well as upper nobility. Between 1400 and 1500, at least another 131 towers were constructed in Scotland. Of these, 85 were rectangular in plan, six were square, 25 were L-shaped, and, and for 15, the layout can't be verified. While many of these new oblong towers, such as Clay, Corsewall, and Bar Tower were of similar grand size to their 14th century counterparts, a greater number were far smaller. The tower at Ruthven, for instance, was 6.2 by 5.4 meters. Kremen Tower is roughly 6.5 by 7.5 meters, and Moosewald Place is roughly 7.5 by 5.5 meters. Of the 56 towers for this period, which have survived well enough for there to be dimensions available, 22 were under 100 square meters, so smaller than any built in the 14th century, and smaller than the average tower built in England in the same period. These smaller towers belong to men such as the scholar James Hamilton, First Lord Hamilton, or as they did in England, serve small, as smaller defensive outposts for major border lords, such as Cockburn's Path Tower did for the Dunbars and the Douglases. Another 22 towers were between 100 and 150 square meters, six between 150 and 185, and an impressive five come in at over 220 square meters, larger than those built in the previous century, including Ravenscraig and Newark Castle. In that same period of time, some older sites, including Dundonald and Fivey, had extra wings on, added on to them. Uh, to include extra accommodation. At 5E, this included nearly doubling the size of the... Ah, I, I thought I had the wrong size. There we go. <laughs> At 5E, this included nearly doubling the size of the building and creating an L-shaped complex. At Dundonald, instead of creating a new wing, the South Tower was added, we think around 1415, to include, bed, to include more bedrooms, around the same time that the upper hall was divided into two rooms, likely creating a more palatial style reception area and outer bedchamber, or office, out of what was once one large feasting hall and possible bedroom. 
the exact number of towers in Scotland in these early centuries is much more difficult to trace than in England, as no reliable surveys were conducted until the 16th century. But there is some mainly archaeological evidence for the construction of around 50 tower houses throughout Scotland in the 14th century, maybe around 130 throughout the 15th century, and at least 332 named sites throughout the 16th century. In my search for tower houses, I also encountered just shy of 600 sites, which had too few remains to either be dated to a specific period or to be undeniably classed as tower houses. So they were included in the study, meaning that there were up to at least 1,100 possible tower houses in pre 17th century Scotland, or possibly more that have been entirely lost to us. Over the course of the 14th and 15th centuries, tower house construction was spread fairly evenly throughout mainland Scotland, not showing any huge preference towards any one county or towards the borders, making it difficult to make the argument that these towers were a product of border warfare, but were seemingly more a product of the culture and economy of a post-wars of independence Scotland. It wasn't until the 16th century that the tower house in Scotland evolved into the small border tower we think of today. Of the 332 towers built in Scotland throughout the 16th century, 122, so over a third, were built in the two border councils of Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish borders. This works out to one tower per roughly 91 square kilometers in the border counties and only one per 316 square kilometers everywhere else. So the concentration is about is a little over three times in the borders as it is to everywhere else. 16th century border towers in Scotland were slightly smaller on average than towers in the northern counties of Scotland, with most in the borders between 20 and 110 meters square, while those built further north were in that, in that same period range between 30 and 130 meters squared. Which seems to show that in both Scotland, as well as in Ireland, more conflict ridden regions produce smaller, stouter towers than were prevalent in less conflicted areas. Additionally, 16th century towers in the borders tended to be much simpler in plan than those built elsewhere. For those built outside of the borders with known layout, 23 are Z plan, one is T plan, 74 are L plan, and one is quadrangular, leaving a total of 99 towers with multiple wings and 96 towers with only one wing. So 99 that are fancy and 96, only one way. <laughs> to contrast, in the border counties, only one known Z plan was constructed, 2T plan, 25L plan, meaning that there are 28 known multi-wing tower houses against 91 square or oblong tower houses in the borders. The smaller 16th century tower house seems to resemble seemed to resemble those that had been constructed in the 14th and 15th centuries in England and Ireland with entrances on the ground floor, possibly for livestock or storage, and often vaulted basements and apartments above with only occasional outer works. Some, with great, ex some great examples of remains of vaulted with vaulted basements include Whitslade and Rymer's Towers in the Scottish Borders and Lock House and Breckenside in Dumfries and Galloway. For towers without vaulted cellars, uh, slightly less seems to have survived, but Slax Towers and Lethom Peel, both in the Scottish borders, survive at least high enough to show that no vault existed. And the remains of Slax Tower also show us that the tower was accessed both by a ground floor entrance and a separate first floor en entrance accessed by the outside, indicating that the downstairs could likely have been used for storing livestock. Meanwhile, Larger tower houses grew even larger and more elaborate. Beginning a shift from the tower house to manor house, 16th century saw the emergence of Z-shaped and T-shaped tower houses, where more wings were added with more rooms, expanding the privacy network and keeping elite Scottish homes, at least internally, more in league with those elsewhere in Europe. Ah, I've done it again. There we go. It's important to stop here and talk about the evidence because as some of you may know, in 1590, a survey of sorts was completed in the borders of Scotland in the form of a map, which was meant to show the existing fortification in the Scottish marches. 
This map could alert us to towers we could not we would not have otherwise known about and therefore had the potential to skew the number of evidence towers in favor of the borders, meaning that there might be more elsewhere that we just didn't know about. Though I think it's important to stress that I don't think that's the case. Of the 122 towers that I have listed as being built in the borders in the 16th century in Scotland, only two are dated to the 16th century through their appearance on this map. One is Gillespie, which survives with enough physical evidence to, be, to have been identified and possibly dated to the 16th century outside of being on this map. And the other is Ross Castle. And with only the basement of Ross still present beneath a later house, Ross is the only location of the 122 which might rely firmly on the map for its identification, meaning without the map's existence, our numbers would barely have differed. So with its peak in the 16th century, Scotland then seems to have been the last to have adopted the tower house as an established trend in border fortification, specifically among the gentry and lower nobility. Again, without early documentation, Again, without early documentation, owners are significantly harder to trace in Scotland than in England, apart from the royal and aristocratic owners of larger tower houses, particularly in earlier periods. And for many of the smaller tower houses, the names of early owners and builders are not known, though this can possibly serve to tell us that in many cases, the family stood of similar status to their Irish and English counterparts, of possible local importance, but not enough national significance for their names to have survived through history. The 17th century in Scotland saw some continuation of the growth of Z plan towers along with U plan and E plan, but the union of the crowns in 1603 saw the easing of tensions along the border and along with it decreased need for fortification and the rise of the stately home over the fortified dwelling. So to wrap up, let's go back and follow the story of the tower house in Scotland with one that most of you know well. If you've followed me this far, you'll likely have caught that handily, Dundonald Castle makes a fantastic example for much of the tower house's development. Going off of educated estimates in the castle's original excavation report from 1986 and 1993, Alexander's castle was likely built between 1240 and 1260 and was destroyed around 1298 under Robert the Bruce in order to keep it from being used being of use to the English, though the hill itself did end up in English hands from 1298 to 1306. After it came back to the Stuarts in 1306, there doesn't seem to have been much development, likely because a new fortification on the site would have made it a fresh target. It wasn't until around 1371, amidst a new trend of tower house building in Scotland, that the new King Robert II decided to build the current tower house on the site. The original tower stood unaltered for around 50 years before his grandson, King James I, funded the renovation of the castle and added the South Tower. In order to add bedrooms, split up the upper chamber and create more privacy. By 1580, though, even the expanded version of the castle was not large or private enough to serve the present owners, the Wallaces of Craigie, and they constructed nearby Auchins Castle, a vast L-plan house constructed largely of our stone taken from Dundonald Castle and its Barmican Wall. So looking back, we have a small stout tower house which grew up in England beginning in the 14th century, and then in Ireland starting in the 15th century seemingly as a response to small scale raiding, which had become prevalent in both of those periods. In Scotland, however, the tower house took what seems to be an entirely different path. Large oblong tower houses became the go-to fortified residences in the 14th century, once large castle building was abandoned after the Wars of Independence. Throughout the 14th and 15th centuries, tower houses grew in popularity and became larger and more complex in some areas and smaller and more compact in others. The Scottish tower house, instead of coming directly across the border from England, seemingly also evolved in a roundabout way from the Norman style of Keep Castle and yielded a similar result to England's 14th century Peel Tower, albeit two centuries later. Uh, oh, there is some in the chat. Oh, here we go. And I'm very sorry if 
some of you were left waiting for a little while to come back in. <laughs> uh, let me just go through and see if we have questions in the chat box. So sorry. Colin, if Scotland didn't have tower houses until the 14th century, where did the lesser nobility and gentry live before then? Seems unlikely that the country was so peaceful and law-abiding. I don't, I don't think that I would imply that it was peaceful, so peaceful and law-abiding before the 14th century that they didn't need tower houses. I certainly don't think that's the case. Um, and to be perfectly honest, pre 14th century, pre wars of independence, I couldn't tell you what the what the small fortification situation was in Scotland. Um, there were hall houses, but they were even those were for the nobility or the rich, the, the you know, at least lower nobility. So I, I don't know that um, fortification was necessarily widely accessible. I wouldn't say that a tower house was even widely accessible, but accessible to the gentry until the small tower house became popular. Um, I think stone houses are about as, as good as you're going to get, but that's really pre, pre wars of independence. Apart from the hall house, I don't know too, too much about fortification in, in Scotland anyways. That is a good question. Uh, let's see, let me make sure I haven't skipped anybody. So what is the difference between a tower house and a castle keep? That is a fantastic question. And to be perfectly honest, as far as the structure goes, there isn't much of a difference. And a tower house looks a lot like a castle keep. And actually we think that it's inspired by a castle keep. The main difference is that is the setting that it's in. So a castle keep is set within grounds that typically have other fortified buildings. So a castle keep would be set in, you know, within walls, possibly a gatehouse um, that's connected to those walls. So a castle complex we think of as something, at least what I define in my thesis as something that has more than one fortified building, as where a tower house has only, only that one like you think of as a castle keep, but just plopped by itself with nothing else that's fortified. Um, but that's a, a really good analogy. And that's why we think that the tower houses are really inspired by Norman castle keeps because a lot of them are shaped very similarly, um, but are generally a bit smaller than your big Norman castle keeps. Um. What did the extension at Dundonald Castle look like? Right, so the extension at Dundonald Castle, and I don't know, is it Leon, you're very welcome to turn your mic on if you like and chat to me. Um, at Dundonald Castle, the extension is the South Tower. So instead of being L plan, it sort of adds to the oblong shape of the castle. So the South Tower, and unfortunately, I the picture that I had of it on the slideshow was atrocious and I couldn't find a decent picture of it. And the South Tower at this point is the bit of the castle that is the most ruinous, but it is quite a small space. I wanna say it's only about four meters wide on the inside, if that. Um, and it is one room above the other, above the other. And we think it was used for bedrooms. So it is entered, if you go from the hall, you know, what we think of as the lay hall or the lower hall, and you walk straight through, we think that that would have ended, that building would have ended there, but then in the 14th century, but then in the 15th century, you then could walk into what would have been bedrooms on every level um, uh, in the South Tower. So if you look at, let's see, if I can get the one up that is the model. Oh, there she is. And now she's gone. So this bit here is actually the extension at Donald Castle. Um, so it's in, it's already in the model there. And it is just 
what we think is basically three bedrooms on top of each other. Down in the bottom is where the prison and the pit is. And there is some debate over whether that was actually, some of that was actually there previously in Alexander's castle. Um, so that's a bit of a question mark, but all of this, we know this top bit was added later than the rest of this. I hope that helps. The main reasons that tower houses survived from the medieval period to 17th century Scotland. I think it differs certainly in Scotland than I think it did in the other, in, in England and in Ireland. And Scotland is something that is new to me, <laughs> studying the tower house in Scotland. But I think it really thrived specifically in the borders because of local conflict. I think it, it takes on a different shape. And that's what I was trying to get at, although maybe didn't get at completely, is that after the Wars of Independence, instead of being able to build these large massive castles that you could build in the 13th century, the money isn't there anymore for that. So instead of getting these huge castles, you're now getting tower houses like Nandonald. If you think Nandonald was built by King Robert II, that is essentially as grandiose a new structure as was being built in the late 14th century. Uh, from that point, it then starts to trickle down. And so instead of building really large, really grandiose castles in the 14th and 15th centuries, you start getting tower houses and tower houses that are extended and then extended some more. And then on the other end, like I said, you're getting tower houses that are smaller and they kind of resemble the ones in England because they're needed for border conflict. So I think tower houses survive because on the one end they become a replacement for castles. <laughs> they are the new castle in Scotland for the super rich. And on the other end, they are um, the, you know, the gentry's means of fortification. I can't say it's the poor person's means of fortification because a poor person, you know, a, a, an everyday Joe could never have afforded a tower house. They are uh, the poorest person that could have afforded it. When I say, you know, gentry, that's like the, the lowest of nobility. Um, that's still not, <laughs> that's still not an everyday Joe. Um, and so that really, really, that fortification still really needs to exist at least until the union of the crowns when there's not such everyday friction. Uh, great. I don't know. I mean, you guys are very welcome to turn your mics off on and raise your hands if you want to. Otherwise, if anyone has any more questions, you can pop them in the chat. Very quiet. Great. In which case, uh, our next, I should say before we before we go, that our next talk will be on Mason's Marks. It's going to be Ian Ross Wallace, and it's going to be same time, same place, and he is June 10th. 7 p.m. And so Lauren will get that advertised ASCP. So if Mason Smarks is something that interests you, please keep an eye because that's our next talk and you can get signed up for that. As Lauren said, all of our talks are recorded. So if you're going to miss that one or if there's anything you missed today or any of our previous talks and you're not a member, please go to our website and get signed up because you'll get the links to all of our talks. You'll have access to all of the talks. And um, so have a, have a look. I promise it's very worth it. Kirstein. Yes, I, can I just say thank you all to everyone so much for your attendance tonight. We had a wonderful attendance yet again at these lovely talks which Blythe have arranged, has arranged monthly for us and we really do appreciate you, you joining us and taking the time from lovely to see in the chat people coming from all over yet again to, to take part in these discussions and hear what I have to say is a wonderful talk. Heartfelt thanks Blythe for delivering such an excellent and interesting talk for us all. Um, I'm sure that everyone has thoroughly enjoyed listening to such a great talk about the history of Tower Houses. So thank you very, very much, Fly. Thank you. We do appreciate it. Are there any final questions? I think someone was maybe trying to say oh, something. I was going to ask was, to Blythe, was there many 
tower houses for the clans in the Highlands? Did, 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 was there many t t town houses up there? Um, so let's bring back up. I know you said that's what you showed me that, but I just seen a book. It's called The Tower Houses of the Clans. Um, I I don't know too much about the ownership. I'm going to be completely honest. I have I have made the map of where each one was, and the concentration of them when you look at the Highlands specifically is lower than it is um, elsewhere. It's it's lower than it is. So the highest concentration is obviously in the borders. And then you have in like the central strip, it's slightly higher than that. And then for some reason, Aberdeenshire has a, this, a, apart from the borders, the second highest concentration. And that's for every century, not just the 16th century, but every century Aberdeenshire has loads of them. And I can't explain that because as I say, for most of the towers, we can't attribute any kind of ownership. But as far as, as, far as those being built by the clans, I'm really sorry, I can't say. I don't know. I'll have to, I will have to read the book then. <laughs> you'll, see, you'll, see, you'll have to read the book and report back to me. Um, and then we had in the courtyard at Dundonald Castle, what was the storage room? Uh, Leon, I think, are you talking about if you go into the, the inner courtyard, there's a storage cellar. Um, and that is kind of next to, it'd be kind of in front of the prison or what we're calling the pit prison. And that is a question mark for us, to be honest. But I think most of us attribute that to Alexander's castle. Am I right, Kirstine, in thinking that? So that's a remnant from Alexander's castle. So a remnant from the 13th century castle. In fact, a lot of that, that bit that it's almost rubble looking there in the courtyard, we think is our remnants from the 13th century castle um, and presumably would have been used as part of the 14th century castle and you know, built over and used, but weren't necessarily built as part of the tower house. hope that answers that <laughs> but it is just storage you're right it's it's just a cellar okay are there any any more questions before i wrap up don't want to lock anyone out Great, great. In that case, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. As I say, the next one will be June 10th, and it'll be Ian Ross Wallace from the University of Glasgow on Mason's Park. So keep an eye out for that one. And thank you again. Thank you so much, Blythe. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>